So what is electroculture and how can it help improve the health of our soil? If we go back in time, you have 1920s Justin Cristo flow. Justin Cristo flow created all these atmospheric antennas using copper and zinc and brass to basically harness the earth's energy so that he didn't have to use pesticides. What he noticed was at the time that his food would grow two to three times the size of what it normally is. Now, Matt has been talking about electroculture for months. Really simple, here's the easiest thing. I went to Ace Hardware, I got some wooden dowels, I got copper wire, I wrapped it in a spiral, almost like the DNA or Kundalini, yep. up up the wood, so I, I created an, an antenna. That's it, and by the way, it was fun, because I got to tell the people at Ace Hardware, and they were like, what are you doing? What is this? They're taking notes. So that's how easy it was. Matt, why does it work? Basically, what electroculture is, is basically harnessing the Earth's energy that's all around us, the ether, the orgone, the chi, the prana, everything that's all around us that we are, just can't see. What you're doing is you're taking a piece of wood with copper or brass. You can use either one. And you're taking that and you're putting it into the ground and you're creating an ether antenna. And that ether antenna is going to pick up the frequencies that are all around and help increase the magnetism and the sap, the blood of the plant. I think this is a good opportunity to share with everybody our electroculture gardening results. Here's a perfect example of a 14 day difference utilizing no copper and copper and how you can grow your plants faster. So electroculture has been hidden from our society reason being because of pesticide companies and all of these chemical companies. They want you to spray chemicals all over your crops and all different types of fertilizers and things that are very, very toxic to us. Our soil has been heavily depleted and this goes back into all the pesticide use and chemical use. This is Monsanto's Roundup. It's in cookies, breads, corn, crackers, chips, breakfast cereals, and beer. The list goes on and on and on. The active ingredient in Roundup is called glyphosate, and it's used by backyard gardeners and industrial farmers alike to kill invasive weeds. And whether glyphosate is harmful to humans or not is something of a $66 billion question. But first, what is glyphosate? There's never been a herbicide like it before. Glyphosate was originally introduced in 1974 by Monsanto. Its use in American agriculture has soared nearly tenfold since Monsanto introduced the first genetically modified Roundup Ready seeds in 1996. Glyphosate is now used in more than 160 countries, with more than 1.4 billion pounds applied per year. Now, Monsanto has its own invasive species creeping in. Doubt. Hundreds of plaintiffs with cancer have filed a class action lawsuit against the company. In 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, known as IARC, determined glyphosate to be a probable carcinogen. It was a shocking number of people's bodies contained glyphosate in mm. them, which is Roundup. Disturbing weed killer ingredient tied to cancer found in 80% yeah. of U.S. urine samples. Herbicide companies that was talking about well, it's just a minimal amount, <laughs> a, a tiny amount of a, a parts per million. You can't even find it if you're looking for it. Nothing to see here. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's poison. There's zero amount of that that should be in your body. Monsanto denies any link between the active ingredient in Roundup and cancer. The company plans to appeal the verdict. The jury also determined Monsanto failed to warn consumers of dangers associated with the products Johnson used. So if that was on the label, people can make an informed choice. The snakes just wish they'd had more information about Roundup. I should have known. But in saying that, the bloody bastards that actually made this product, they should have made us all informed. I would like to see them admit that they, they had hidden this for a long time and that they realized it was not safe. I'm here to plant a seed today. The question is, will that seed have a chance to take root or will I be sued by Monsanto <laughs> and forced to use their seed? That's why we see people premature aging faster than ever, right? You have people with health conditions at like the age of 10, they have a health condition. It doesn't even make any sense. You're going, your body is slowly starting to break down and that's what all these things are doing is they're breaking us down at the cellular level so that our body just falls apart. When you have big farms that have thousands of acres and you're growing one crop, such as corn, canola, soy, wheat, 
whatever it may be, and you're dousing it with over 4 billion pounds of pesticides that are loaded with iron. When they're loaded with iron, what starts to happen is you basically diminish the magnetism or life force of the soil, and you start to yield food that pretty much has no nutrients, which that's why like if you ate an apple in 1900s, you probably got like 2000% of your vitamin C, versus if you ate an apple in 2022, you probably got 1%. If I have copper on this side and I have iron on this side, if I put copper in the soil, this is an electrical conductor and it right. also, it, it harnesses the magnetism that's around you all the time, right? It can help enhance things. Iron though, on the other hand, is not a good conductor and it blocks the magnetism. So it's actually blocking the magnetism of the earth. So when they're spraying all these pesticides that are loaded with iron, then they go on with their iron tools and they just like destroy the land and whatever else. You are basically just ripping the life force out of the soil. If we are using electroculture and understanding everything is frequency and harmony and balance, then we could have as much food as we want. It's like we can have an abundance. When they tell you that there's a food shortage, they're just making stuff there's up war in Ukraine. so they can put you into fear. But basically what you're doing is you're creating an atmospheric antenna to harness the energy of the earth so that you can boost your soil and your plants. You'll start to notice you'll have more bees, you'll have more birds, and you won't have to use pesticides, you won't have to use fertilizers. What you're doing is you're bringing back the electrical charge. So we are electrical beings, and these plants are also, our beautiful plants here are also electrical beings. They have sap, right? The sap is their blood, just like we have our blood. And what happens is, is when you put this copper or brass antennas near them, now what you're doing is you're enhancing the sap that is always flowing through the plant so that the plant can get more nutrients and live a healthier life. This week, we've been focusing on the organic movement, gaining more and more traction around the world. As agriculture meets innovation, the seeds are being sown for alternative approaches to growing big without pesticides and fertilizers. Our Mindy Tweedle meets an entrepreneur from France with a magnetic personality, making his first presentation in Canada. This capsule may well hold the key to helping solve the world's food crisis. Along with magnets, they were placed in the earth for an experiment, and the results speak for themselves. Vegetables were three to five times bigger than normal. The applications from the influence of uh, magnetic fields and electromagnetic waves that are all around us on planet world. So in 1999, he studied engineering and agriculture at the University of Ghent in Belgium and learned how you can fertilize your soil with, uh, with magnets. <laughs> it's strange, but uh, I explained this. Electroculture is a field of using electricity, electrical fields and currents to help soil fertility, plant growth and development. As an independent researcher and advisor for farmers, he explains this to people all over the world. And I explain how you can uh, work with uh, waves that are invisible to us, but that you can measure with devices and, and that you can improve the environment of a farm or of the fields to uh, grow better your plants. Everybody has now the, the, the awareness that there is an influence of waves on life and, and, uh, but you can also use that in a beneficial way and, 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 and that is what interests me and, and that is what what interests me to develop the applications for agriculture. And so he has. Just look at the size of the plants that Yannick has grown using natural energy. Planting the seeds for a concept that could grow on farmers everywhere. Electroculture. Electroculture. Electric culture. Yes, we're going to try some hippie stuff. I think I might have blown some minds with that word right there. Electroculture. It's a proven fact. And the theory here is that passing low levels of electricity through the soil and actually ambiently around the plant can help prevent against disease, help with nutrient uptake, you name it. We've been having issues with irrigation and I've been doing a deep dive on electroculture. I thought I'd do a little video on Electroculture. Qui, dans son livre de l'électricité des végétaux, nous relate l'électro. Electroculture is where you're trapping the electric ions in the air into your garden. You're trapping them by using men. We're going to bring energy in from the atmosphere into the orchard. Throwing in a stake or making some really cool, funky sculptures. Let's go install some 
electroculture, which is going to increase fertility of the soils. And then we're gonna come back with some magnets wrapped in beeswax with some galvanized steel with the north-south orientation to do phase two of electroculture. Now this is becoming more and more common. I keep on seeing like TikToks and stuff about it, which is kind of funny. So today we're gonna to talk about electroculture and these are some examples right here of electroculture working because what I've seen is so many people's farms and so many gardens explode because of using electroculture. Now this is an image from Erin. Her cauliflower are pretty much two times the size of my head and she grew them just using some copper antennas and some copper pyramids. All she did was take some wood, wrap it with some copper, making it into a spiral going up into the air. And this created an atmospheric antenna which picks up on the ether, the chi, the orgone, the prana, all the stuff that's all around us to help boost the sap life of the plant. What's happening right now is our plants are being bombarded with so many frequencies and all this radiation and it's starting to impact our soil, dry out the soil and destroy the life force of the soil so electroculture can be a solution for this. What is the secret to growing giant plants? Do you ever remember seeing pictures of giant cabbages or giant pumpkins? What may have been the secret to growing these vegetables is a lost farming technology known as electroculture. Due to the worldwide shortage of fertilizer, countries like China are investigating the use of electroculture and finding amazing results. They are achieving a 25 to 50% increase in yield with a 75% reduction in fertilizers and pesticides. Let's help spread the word about electroculture farming. When you start doing electroculture, all your pollinators start coming back. I got bees all over, I got bees who sit on me, I got bees everywhere and whatever. You start to see all these insects come back because they also pick up on the resonance in the frequency that's all around us. Birds as well too, as they have crystals in their skull and those crystals are basically like magnetite, which is like a magnet so that they can pick up on where to go. So birds actually emit a frequency to tell plants to open up their leaves called the stomata. It's this part of their cell so that they can absorb the nutrients. So like anytime you hear that rooster comes up at four in the morning, that rooster sends out a signal to all the plants to open up and absorb all the rays and all the nutrients. You know, when we hear birds chirping, it's very magical, it's very healing. But it's also very healing for the plant because it accelerates plant growth as well too. It's all I've realized is there's so much potential. And that's the thing is I, I really despise fear because it's all just playing on the same emotion. And we really could have so much and we could really live in such a beautiful world. And that's all I want to be in, you know, and I don't want any other nonsense. And it's like, you know, with with this simple technique and it costs, it costs you two bucks, you know, you could have your plants going crazy. And also too, the more love and empathy you put into your garden, the more plants will respond too, right? Because they can pick up on all your emotions and that goes into our conscious minds of shamanism and druidism and all the ancient times and our ancient predecessors who were very connected with the land, you know, energy workers, energy healers, like it's just, it's wild. We need to connect back to that and really go out in nature and be a part of it and also touch our soil, you know, because when we go out there with rubber shoes on, we're not touching the soil, we're disconnected. You know, and all of these things are different ways in which we've been disconnected. And as we raise, in my opinion, the vibration of the soil and the vibration of our plants and the vibration of our health, we can then help other people do the same thing as well. All this information is incredible you're sharing. It's just, wow. Um, now, speaking of narratives, we're seeing on mainstream media right now, a lot of talk about water shortages as well. First, it was food shortages. Now it's water shortages. And some are saying it's an emergency. So what's your take on this? And I know you talk about something called primary water versus secondary water. Can you kind of get into that as well? Of course. So primary water is hydrogen and oxygen being pressurized and pushed up from inside the earth to create unlimited water. Right? So first and foremost, we're never running out of water. There's always water being created every single day. It's all around us. You could find it in a spring. You could find it by a volcano. You could find it near a waterfall. You could find it anywhere you go. You could dig deep enough and there'll be water coming out. So we have primary water, which is water that comes up from inside the earth and is always being created. Then we have our secondary water, which is this rain water cycle, which is always being manipulated, right? So we have this cycle and we have this cycle. This one is unlimited and infinite. And then this one is just always being messed with and who knows what it, what even this water is. It's filled with heavy metals and whatever else. So we have these two. So they try to do this whole, we're running out of water. Now you need to stop gardening. Oh, there you go. Take away your ability to grow food. 
And then also stop, you know, washing your car, stop doing this, stop taking a shower, stop doing that, stop cooking. You know, you're doing all of this so that we can usher in forms of taxes to control and manipulate you at the water level. Right. Now it's interesting too, because when you look at the secondary water cycle over here too, it's not alive, it's not structured, it's not beautiful. It doesn't have a snowflake being like in the molecular structure, it's dead. It looks like applesauce. So when we place it onto our skin, it also does the same effect. It causes aging, it destroys the body. Same with tap water. It's loaded with fluoride, it's loaded with pesticides, arsenic, lead, and all these things. So that's this water cycle, which is very goofy. And then you have this primary water, which is structured. When a person sits in primary water, they will instantly come back to life because there's so much oxygen and hydrogen to hydrate the body that their body will instantaneously start to recover. That's why if you go out in nature, you go up there and you sit in these springs, you will feel like a whole different person within about 30 minutes mm. because the oxygen and hydrogen will absorb into your skin and your body will start to restructure and you'll be fully charged. Let's talk primary water. So with the water situation, what they're trying to push is that we're running out of water and we're not running out of water. We will never run out of water because we live on a water planet. But basically what there is, is that it's called primary water. It's water that comes up from inside the earth. If you ever go to like a spring or like a volcano or a creek or a river, you see all that roaring water. It's basically the combination of hydrogen and oxygen coming up from inside the earth to create unlimited new water that does not have pesticides, that does not have sprays, that does not have fluoride. There's no chemicals in it. So what they're gonna try to do is, and that's what they're doing right now, is they're trying to say, you know, the lakes are getting low, which all the lakes are man-made holding tanks. So this is a real big one. When you look at a lake, there's 53,000 holding tanks in the United States alone. A lot of those actually have cities underneath that. That's a whole nother topic. What? But, yeah. I think what, oh, what happened was is they put the lake in that spot to cover up the ruins. Oh. 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 Right. 130 feet underwater is a maze of temples, arches, roads, and houses. This is China's real-life Atlantis, although it was never lost and it was sunk on purpose. This was a massive government project that forced 290,000 people to relocate their homes as more than 1,300 villages and tens of thousands of acres of farmland were flooded and submerged. Even though this city is over 1,400 years old, it has only been submerged for about 60 years when the Chinese government decided to build the hydroelectric dam and create Qiandao Lake. And create Qiandao Lake. So they try to keep us away from this primary water specifically because of the healing potentials that it has and also to create that scarcity mindset so they can usher in all this, I'm, we're running out of water and blah, blah, blah. So it's interesting with the whole primary water because we're never taught about it. We're always taught about these, but these clouds with this rainwater cycle. And if we stop getting rain, all of a sudden we're gonna run out of water. Okay. But if you come to Arizona and you see how green it is over here, these trees are getting water from somewhere else. They're not getting water from the sky. They're getting water from deep inside the earth. Simple story, and this is the easiest one to just debunk it all. And Lake Elsinore, right, California. Lake Elsinore started to go dry in the 1950s, okay? So they had to call up a dowser who basically came out with dowsing rods. And this is how you can find primary water very easily. You get yourself some dowsing rods where they're basically made out of copper or brass, and you can find water pretty much wherever you want to go. But anyways, he came out. He goes, there's water right here. You're going to drill about 75 feet. The dowsing rods just crossed, and you're going to drill here. The people who were in the system at that time that were like, this guy's a witch, he's a weirdo, you know, he's whatever, because that's how it always is. Right. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Within, I think it was two months of time after they drilled the well, put it all together, everything else, Lake Elsinore was refilled and filled with water. And that's it. And there you go. The water has came back and he found it. Okay, he's right, because I grew up in Lake Elsinore. That's my hometown. And there we go. It went dry. And all of a sudden, there's water now. And it's a huge, like, where did this water come from? Mm -hmm. Like, look, it went dry in, in 1950. And I'm talking, it's huge. It's like one of the biggest, it's huge. I lived, I grew up in high school. They got boats. And it went dry. And there is pictures of it being dry that we are, as a little kid, they take you to the museums. You're like, that's home. That's Lake Elsinore's museum. You're like, cool. You don't think about it. But it did go dry at one point. Where the fuck did this water come from? It's got no rivers. 
There's a great book called New Water for the Thirsty World, and anybody can look that up. They can also go to the Primary Water Institute and look that up as well, too, .org. And just do your research, because when you start to realize this of this fear set, and there's always the water's going out, they know that they can make a lot of money, and that if we're disconnected from that, they can take advantage of that. You know, so it really starts to connect the dots of how, in my opinion, and I know deep down in my heart, we're never running out of water. It is water, right? How did we get to the point where we're paying for bottled water? Someone's like, uh, Pierre, the Americans are pretty dumb, but they're not going to buy water. Oh, yes, they are. Let's just tell the Americans the water's from France. We bought it.